Hello, and welcome to Love Gianna. Today, we are back with the amazing Dr. Barnard. Thank you so much for being with us again. Hi there, Gianna. Great to see you. Good to see you. So we'll be discussing your book, Your Body in Balance, and all things hormone related. Shall we dive into the questions? You bet. What causes insulin resistance and is a diet high in carbohydrates one of the primary causes? Oh, what a great question. You know, so many people, they're worried about getting a touch of diabetes or getting diabetes itself, or they got prediabetes or it's in their family. And insulin resistance is what feeds into that. And it's linked to all kinds of other things like PCOS, which can lead to infertility and all kinds of misery. Um, but I have to tell you, Gianna, people have got this kind of, they got the wrong end of the stick a little bit. They're thinking, okay, it's gotta be that I ate too much rice or ate too many sweet potatoes, or they're thinking that carbohydrates are the issue and that's really not it at all. Um, and without getting overly complicated, it actually comes down to what's going on inside your cells. If you could take a powerful microscope and look at say your muscle cells, your liver cells, what you could see is that glucose molecules are powering those cells and insulin resistance comes when fat from all the food that you eat, whether it's mayonnaise or cheese or chicken wings or whatever, the fat gets into the cells, then the glucose can't get in anymore. That's insulin resistance. Um, so what's the answer to all of this? The answer to diabetes, the answer to prediabetes and these other conditions I mentioned is to get the animal products out of your diet. If you do that, how much animal fat is left? Zero. And if you keep the, the other greasy foods to a minimum as well, it's amazing. The body just transforms in such a way that that insulin resistance goes down. If somebody has diabetes, their doctor starts saying, wow, we got to cut back you back on your medications. Whatever you're doing, you're getting better and better. And for people who have had diabetes in their families, they can be the one who, who never gets it. And when you teach your family members the same tricks, you can help them too. What is gestational diabetes and how does diet play a role in bringing this on? Yeah, diabetes uh, can occur at different times of life. And if it occurs during pregnancy, that's what we call gestational diabetes. And doctors are nervous about it because it has consequences for mom, it has bigger consequence, consequences for the baby, and it tends to recur in the next pregnancy. So even though it does typically subside after the pregnancy is over, it's really a sign not only that it's gonna happen again in the next pregnancy, but even if you don't get pregnant, you're probably headed for type two diabetes and then you're gonna have it for the rest of your life. And the cause is really what you and I were just talking about just now, Gianna. It's the fat that we eat, we thought was kind of innocuous, gets inside the cells of the body. And as it does, they don't respond to insulin anymore. They're insulin resistant and the sugar builds up in your blood instead of getting into the cells. The doctor takes a blood sample and says, it's full of sugar, you got gestational diabetes. And so then people mistakenly avoid carbohydrate when the real problem is the fatty junk they're eating. And so when, when somebody gets diagnosed with this, when they're pregnant, can they shift their diet, obviously with the doctor's, you know, guidance and everything. Um, if they shift their diet when they're pregnant, will the gestational diabetes go away? They definitely should shift their diet. Um, and, and I got to tell you, it's, it's hard for pregnant women to do anything without their doctor, their mother, their spouse, everybody else giving them advice about what they shouldn't do. So it's, you know, my heart breaks for them. It's really tough. Every, you know, the people in the grocery store line start giving you advice, you know? I mean, it, it's like crazy, um, but absolutely, there is no reason to have a drop of animal fat in your diet at all. And you're better off without it. Now, now the, the best thing though, is if we can switch before, the pregnancy starts, um, that's the best thing. You know, plant-based diets, you wanna plan them like every other diet. If you're gonna get pregnant, you wanna be eating healthy foods, you wanna give it a lot of thought. But if, you're, if what you're choosing is from the realm of vegetables and fruits and whole grains and beans, and you're taking your B12 as you wanted to anyway, you know, that's so much better than a diet with the chicken fat and the fish fat and the beef fat and the pork fat. And, you know, you don't need that stuff at all. You, you, uh, but uh, wherever you are in life, Never too late to never too late to make that transition. Very true. How do hormones influence the health of skin and hair? And what promotes thick, healthy hair, prevents hair loss, and promotes smooth, supple, youthful looking skin? You know, this has been such an interesting area um, and, and such a um, controversial one. 
um, for years, teenagers would say, I am sure that what I eat affects my skin. Um, and then the dermatologist would say, nah, it couldn't possibly be. And, and just a simple thing like chocolate. You know, if I eat chocolate, I break out. And, and so researchers started digging into this and they, quite a number of them found that, that in fact, um, there was a, an effect of chocolate. But you know what really happened, Jan? This happens so often in science. Somebody did kind of a goofy study. Um, they studied prisoners. And yeah, I'm not making this up. Um, this was in Pennsylvania. And they brought in a group of prisoners and half of them they gave chocolate to and the other half, they, they were in a control group. And the chocolate consuming prisoners didn't have more acne breakouts than the others. So they decided, you know, chocolate's not an issue. You look a little bit further. And I mean, apart from the fact that it was done in prisoners, all kinds of other issues about the study, the group that didn't get the chocolate got this other simulated chocolate bar that was supposed to be a placebo, but it was filled with this other goopy grease too. In other words, both groups were getting really unhealthy foods and the fact they couldn't tell a difference between the two, it was really not a good study. But to this day, you can go on Wikipedia or anywhere, in any search, any engine you want, is diet affect, will it affect um, acne? And they'll say no because of this study. Okay, so, but other, other, other good research teams have been looking and it's quite clear that diet does affect um, your skin. And I would encourage anybody who's got acne and, and anybody can have a little bit of skin conditions, especially in adolescence, but really at any time of life, um, to A, get the animal products out of our diet. B, I would go, go further. I would get greasy things out of your diet wherever they're from, wherever the, the, the oil is from, because the oil does seem to affect your pores. And the biology of these little microscopic pores where the, where the acne breakouts occur, it's very sensitive. Um, and to the more we get away from the grease, the better off you're gonna do. But don't take my word for it, give it a try. Um, I will mention that some people respond to even really small amounts of offending foods and healthy seeming foods um, like um, skim milk. Why should skim milk affect me? Well, it does for, for a lot of people. So get it out of your diet, see, see how you do. And then what, what can prevent hair loss, let's say in men, because I know it, this, can, this can be um, a hot topic as well. Is it, is it really 100% genetics or does diet have a say in how much hair a man loses? Yeah, interesting. It's, it's actually both. Um, there, there are genes and there are environmental issues. And, and the, the genetic issues are, um, have been a little misinterpreted too. People used to imagine that men got bald, women wouldn't lose their hair. That's got to be the Y chromosome. That must be the answer. Mm -mm, it's not it. Um, men and women both have the same genes that can cause hair loss. If it's in your family, brothers and sisters get the genes the same. What happens is whether the, or the question is whether the genes manifest in hair loss. And in men, the whole reason that those genes manifest is because he's got testosterone and she has much less testosterone. If she, for whatever reason, started to have higher levels of testosterone, either because her body was making it mistakenly as happens in say PCOS uh, or for any other reason, she's gonna lose her hair just like her brother. Um, and if he loses his testosterone, don't try this at home, but um, uh, male children who had say a traumatic accident and lost their testes, then they would never go bald, just, no matter what their, their genes were. So it's partly genetic, but it's also diet because diet affects testosterone effect. How can that be? Um, back in Japan, back in the 1960s, 70s, the diet was mostly rice-based no dairy, not a lot of meat. Then starting in the 80s, 90s, 2000s, uh, meat came in in a big way. And men's hormones started to change. And within the hair follicle in Japan and everywhere else, there was a little more testosterone activity causing baldness to be more common in Japan. Now, the reason that, that uh, dermatologists started to report this is lots of things were changing in Japan as a result. Um, as the Japanese diet westernized, women were having more trouble with menopause, um, waistlines were expanding, diabetes rates were way up, breast cancer, prostate cancer, heart disease was way up, and the dermatologist said, yep, it's happening with male hair loss as well. Uh, Jan, I got to tell you one just funny anecdotal thing. Yes. Um, 
there's my mother had five kids um and i'm number three and i'm one of four boys and my mother said neil this is i was must have been about 45 at the time she said neil you never lost your hair all your brothers lost their hair what's that about she says i think it's your diet and that could <laughs> i don't know if that's true or not but my mom decided to become a vegan too so um <laughs> and for our audience, do you mind sharing your age? Because when you say 45, you look 45. I'm like, oh, when he was 45? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for saying that. Yeah, that was 23 years ago. So, <laughs> Dr. Barnard, yeah, you yes, are dear. goals. I mean, oh, well, thank you. you seriously, I'm not even just saying that because I adore you. You look amazing. You are a billboard of health, seriously. Oh, uh, well, well, thanks thanks for saying that. We're, we're trying to stay young. And I, I've, I've got to tell you, you can't control the, the calendar pages turning, but you can be on a healthy diet and have fun with life. And uh, hopefully you still feel, feel uh, young and healthy. If a male has low testosterone or wants to boost it to gain more muscle mass, is taking prescribed testosterone the only way to increase levels? Or are there specific foods that can help increase levels naturally and significantly? Oh, what a great question. You know, I got to tell you, it's, it's heartbreaking. So many guys go to the doctor and they say, you know, I don't have much, much energy as I used to have. And, 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 and they will, they will use euphemisms. I can't quite, uh, <laughs> what they mean is they're having erectile dysfunction. Um, and so the doctor will give them a diagnosis of low T, um, low testosterone, and they'll do a blood test. They'll find that Hank is sort of marginal with it. But I, I really have to tell you, 99 times out of 100, actually the testosterone has nothing whatsoever to do with it. And I would, I would strongly encourage these people to not be supplementing testosterone because if they do, it's gonna very likely increase the risk of hormone-related cancers, particularly prostate cancer, which we're concerned about. Now, hopefully that will not be the case, um, but I wouldn't wanna take that risk. What he needs to do instead is to get the animal products off his plate um, and if he does that, what happens is you get much better blood flow, not just to your heart, not just to your brain, but to all parts of your body, including the ones that count for sex. Um, and energy improves because, because your uh, blood supply is not just all thick, oily, viscous blood. I'm, I'm drawing an analogy with Hank's car. He, he goes to the store and he gets uh, motor oil that is low viscosity, meaning it's really more liquid and it flows better through the system. Um, his blood is high viscosity. It's thick because of all the chicken fat he's been eating. You get rid of that and your blood flows better. If it flows better, it oxygenates your brain better and you got more energy. So the very same diet that will restore sexual function is also the same kind of diet for, for energy. I am so tired of hearing the term soy boy. Why should men and women alike not fear it? And can we talk in depth about estrogen levels in soy compared to the estrogen in dairy? Are you talking about man boobs? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is a funny thing. I, uh, if you hang out in the, in the locker room, you'll hear guys say that, um, that so-and-so's got man boobs. Um, and, and what the mythology is kind of what you were, you were hinting at. Um, that they imagine that soybeans, well, well, soybeans do have what are called isoflavones. And back in the 1930s, isoflavones were discovered, and it was also discovered that they would adhere to estrogen receptors, say, on a, on a breast cell. And so that led to all kinds of worries. Um, a woman who consumes soy, could she get breast cancer? Uh, if she had breast cancer, could this cause her cancer to progress? And if a young man consumes soy, would it make him effeminate? Would it make him start reading books, for example, hang out at the library? Um, <laughs> just kidding. Um, researchers have had more than enough time to test these things. And first of all, with regard to, to breast cancer, researchers looked at populations consuming very low amounts of soy and very high amounts of soy. Um, Asian Americans, women, for example. And what you find is, striking and consistent, that those women consuming the most soy have about 30% reduction in their likelihood of getting breast cancer. So soy doesn't cause breast cancer. It does the opposite, it reduces the risk. Same thing for women previously diagnosed with cancer. Soy will cut the likelihood of dying of it by maybe about 25 or 30%. And then for, for Hank and his um, man boobs, um, you can go to the beach on a hot August day 
And if you see kind of a chunky guy taking off his shirt and he does have kind of some breast enhancement, you can walk right up to him and you can ask, excuse me, how much tofu have you eaten this past week? Um, I guarantee you, he's gonna say, I don't eat any of that stuff. He, he, this is not a soy eating guy. He's gonna say, I eat pizza, I eat burgers. I'm, an, I'm a chicken wing kind of guy, that's my thing. The reason that he has man boobs, the reason he has breast, breast enhancement is because he's been gaining weight from eating a fatty, meaty diet. And the more fat cells you have, the more estrogen is built in your body. And, and this, this kind of goes back to your earlier question about testosterone in the man's body. Testosterone is coursing through his blood. As the testosterone goes into a fat cell, the fat cell converts it to estrogens. And in other words, the male hormones are being converted to female hormones. That causes his testosterone level to drop and it causes his estrogen level to rise and it causes the breast enhancement to form. So as soon as the man <laughs> like throws out the chicken wings and so forth and goes on a plant-based diet, that will stop. So this will, you know, kind of an answer to what you're asking earlier, his tes testosterone level will more likely get back to where it was. His estrogen level will come back down. The man boobs will go away. Um, and you can have soy milk, tofu all day long. Um, it is not going to cause that kind of effect in, in males. It doesn't have that effect in females either. If a male has higher than desired estrogen level, should he be blaming beans or should one maybe look at the milk, cheese, yogurt, and ice cream consumption? Yeah, uh, the latter, uh, for sure. Um, there is some really important research just came out of Loma Linda University where they looked at, at very large numbers of people and found that in women, dairy consumption, specifically milk, was strongly linked to breast cancer. And the discussion as to, to why, would, why was this, why would regular milk consumption increase the risk by as much as 50%? Um, they made the case that although the amounts of estrogen in milk are relatively small, I mean, they really are just traces, but it's in every glass of milk and in every slice of cheese and every cup of yogurt, and your body already has the estrogen that nature sort of wanted you to have, so that when you have dairy in addition to it, it causes all kinds of problems. And the problems range from hormone-related cancers like breast cancer or uterine cancer, but also other things like endometriosis and monthly menstrual symptoms that recur month after month after month. And I wouldn't ask a woman to take my word for it. If a woman has menstrual pain, and every month, you know, there's gonna be one day where I just can barely function without a fistful of ibuprofen. Try this experiment. For the next two cycles, two months, no animal products at all. I'm gonna make you a vegan. No animal products, there's no animal fat, no dairy in your diet at all. And keep oils low too. What you just, if you do that combination and then just see if your periods don't change. For many women, it is the most amazing life-changing experience they have ever had because not only do they feel better, uh, the pain goes away or diminishes greatly. The PMS symptoms like uh, water retention and bloating and, and moodiness can sometimes improve or just go away. But you also discover something else, which is that you have control. You've got the power over your fundamental biology based on what you're lining up on your plate at mealtime. And it's a little tricky, but once you learn the technique, it's super simple. And it's mostly plant-based foods, keep the oils low, definitely no dairy. Where does erectile dysfunction stem from and what can be done about it without the use of drugs? And do drugs even work? Oh, well, the drugs work only temporarily. And you see this in every clinic in America, including our clinic. Guys come in and they say, you know, doc, I can't raise the flag. You know, they got those other ways of describing this. And, and so that we also say, um, so you, you want, um, Viagra, is that it? Yeah, yeah, I want Viagra, okay. So you write him out a prescription, here's your Viagra prescription, and he'll take the prescription, run out the door, and you, you have to go after him and say, stop, we're not done yet. You have to sit the patient down and explain that your erectile dysfunction did not come from performance anxiety. It came from atherosclerosis. And the patient will say, what does that mean? What it means is that particles of cholesterol in your blood they're irritating the, the walls of the tiny little blood vessels that, that go anywhere in your body, in the, in the coronary arteries to your heart, the carotid arteries that go to your brain. But smaller than both of those are the tiny little arteries that go to your private parts. And if you don't get adequate blood supply there, this kind of hydraulic 
system that is the, a man's sexual anatomy. It just doesn't power up at all. And so, you know, he, he can take Viagra. It's a very short term thing and it doesn't do anything for the rest of his arteries. But if at the same time, he gets the animal products out, keeps oils low, gets, this is a refrain you're gonna hear over and over again. There is now no cholesterol in his diet. There's no animal fat. And that means his cholesterol is gonna go way down. And that means the arteries gradually open up and it's, they don't have to open up very much. Within, oh, six, eight weeks, they've opened up enough that the blood flow will come in and he's going to wake up in the morning <laughs> noticing a big change. Uh, oh, it's, oh, it's amazing. John, I got to tell you. I was raised. <laughs> oh, I, ha I, I have to tell you something. We were doing a study, uh, oh, six or eight years ago, and it was for people with, with late stage diabetes. So these people, they came into the study because they wanted their diabetes better, but worse than that, they had, they had neuropathy, meaning you got pain in your feet and pain in your hands. I had one, one of the participants just broke my heart. He was a, a jazz musician. And he'd say, ah, oh, the neuropathy, his, his fingers were killing him. The, the, the tiny nerves in his fingers were being attacked by the diabetes process. So he went on the, the completely plant-based diet as we use, kept oils low, and he did a re really great job of it. His, his numbers were coming down, his blood sugar was coming down, he's getting better and better. One week he came in and he said, this is fantastic. I was able to play last night. As my band was playing, I didn't have to take a break. I didn't have to shake my fingers out. I, I was young again. And then about three weeks after that, he came back in again. He said, even better. My erectile dysfunction is gone. Yay! <laughs> so it's, it's the side effect of getting the animal products out of your, your diet and the arteries are able to open up. Nice. I hope that helps a lot of people. How does food affect arthritis, inflammation, and CRP levels? Yeah, um, arthritis is an autoimmune condition. And what that means is that your white blood cells are making antibodies, which are microscopic little torpedoes. They're made of protein and they're supposed to attack viruses, but instead they're attacking you. They're attacking the, the lining of your, of your joints and that's rheumatoid arthritis. And so the drugs that you hear advertised like Humira and others, they shut, they shut down your immune system. They, they impair your immune system so that you can't make so many antibodies anymore. And that's why they have all of these warnings about things that they do. Our research has, and, and many other teams too, are looking into why are those antibodies attacking your own cells and, and, and what caused them to form anyway? And the hypothesis was formed many years ago that it's from something getting in your body, not a virus, but foods, especially dairy proteins. It looks like your white blood cells detect the foreign protein that came in your cheese sandwich um, or your ice cream or your yogurt, and they make antibodies to it. And those antibodies then attack the, your system. So what do you do in a research study? Uh, we bring in people, we get those antigens, those food proteins out of their diet. And then you A, track their symptoms, do your joints loosen up? Are they less swollen? Are they less tender? Do you feel better? Can you, can you move around? But we also track a blood test called CRP, which you mentioned. It's C-reactive protein. And it's an objective sign of inflammation. The higher it is, the more inflamed you are. And we see it come right down. And so that matters for rheumatoid arthritis, asthma, Sjogren's disease, which is what made Venus Williams Sjogren's disease, disease is what made her, her career tank several years ago. And it's it, what made her say, all right, vegan diet. And she got her game back. Um, and there are so many other conditions that are in the same category. What does this tell us about autoimmune diseases um, in general and healing from them with diet change? Because a lot of doctors will say, once you have an autoimmune disease, it's forever. Now, can you just treat the symptoms or can you actually get rid of an autoimmune disease with, with diet? Well, you can treat the symptoms, but it's really unsatisfactory. And I, re I really think, Jana, the, the, the big classic one for me is, is asthma. You could take a nine-year-old kid and the nine-year-old kid um, has asthma and he's sitting in class and suddenly a vice goes on his lungs and he can't breathe anymore. And nine people die every day in the United States from that disease. Hopefully it's not that bad, but, but for, for some of these kids, what happens is, um, their lungs are extremely sensitive. 
they, they're in gym class and they're running a little bit and then they suddenly get asthma or they're at a friend's house, the friend has a dog and the dog dander is just enough to trigger their asthma or it's a day when there's a lot of pollen in the air or pollution in the air and their asthma kicks in. What we've discovered is if you take the dietary triggers out, for some reason, the other triggers don't matter so much anymore. Now, if, if, if a person's got asthma and you're on an inhaler, you're on medications, keep doing that and don't cancel your doctor's appointment, get whatever medical care you need. But what you'll discover is especially if you get the dairy out of your diet, but I would get all the animal products out of your diet. What people often discover, and this occurs at any age, is their asthma improves so much, they discover, there's my inhaler. I haven't used that for about three weeks now. And, and they, they discover that the other triggers like dog dander and stuff don't bug them so much anymore either. Now, asthma is a serious condition, take it seriously, but there is no reason to inflict these antigens on yourself. Get them out of your diet and see if you don't do better. And if you have a child who has asthma, run, do not walk to a completely plant-based diet, and not just for you, but for the whole family, because you, the, the, you don't want the temptation around that could hurt your kid. So good, so helpful. Food has the power to not only shift someone's mood, but when the mood gets shifted, one's outlook on life gets better, thus having the power to change the trajectory of a person's life. How can food impact our mood and even mood disorders like depression, for example? You know, this is something that we stumbled into completely accidentally. Um, we were doing a study with Geico, the, the, you know, the car insurance company. And the whole reason we we're doing that is their, their national headquarters is four blocks from my, my office. We're in Washington, DC. And I was talking with their health director who said, we got a lot of people with diabetes. We've got a lot of weight issues. Let's do a vegan diet at Geico. And, and we did. And we published several papers um, doing research studies with Geico in, in 10 different cities around the United States. It was really wonderful to see what a vegan diet will do for you right at work. Um, but in the course of this, we were not only tracking weight problems and blood sugar and cholesterol and so forth, we also were tracking mood. And we happened to notice a couple of things. Number one, uh, people were not absent from work as much, just absenteeism went, started going down. And that was curious. And then people reported their moods were just a little bit better. And so we used specific paper and pencil tests and we, we rated depression and anxiety symptoms separately. And they both seemed to improve. And so we then started looking at other studies and many studies have shown exactly the same thing. And this was not the intention of the study to, to try to change those. We just wanted to see what would happen. But what we think is, is, is happening is two different things. One we've already talked about. We talked about inflammation. Inflammation doesn't just affect your lungs or your joints. When your white blood cells start making inflammatory compounds, they affect the brain. And researchers have started to see that to some extent, depression is an inflammatory condition, meaning that when you see the inflammatory biomarkers on a blood test get better, depression gets better too for a lot of people. That's number one. Number two is the gut affects the brain. And a lot of people, have come to realize that. And I don't just mean when you're constipated, you can't think right, although there's, you, the, your gut bacteria make compounds that can make you feel crummy or make you feel better. And what determines your gut bacteria is not really the probiotic pills you took in the morning. What it is, is, is all of the other things that you were eating that are either gonna nourish healthy bacteria or starve those healthy bacteria. And so when a person is on a, a, a diet with chicken, fish, um, there, there's no fiber in those foods whatsoever. And you're specifically selecting for unhealthy gut bacteria. The minute you change and you're having grains and beans and vegetables and fruits, high fiber, healthy foods, you get the grease out, you are now selecting for healthy gut bacteria. And they respond by making healthier compounds. And within about 14 days, and it's very fast. It doesn't, doesn't have to be six, eight months. Within about 14 days, you'll see very substantial changes in the gut bacteria population, making you feel healthier. So big uh, caveat, depression is dangerous. Suicide is a real issue. If you've got serious depression, stick with your caregiver and follow that advice and make sure you are safe. But recognize that your mood is affected by things, by, it's not just Zoloft out there. Um, the, 
the foods that, that you eat are a huge chemical mixture that help or hurt how you feel from day to day. The things you add to it, like alcohol and caffeine, play roles, play, play roles of their own. And whether you sit at home or lace up your sneakers and get your heart pumping and get out in the sun and get with other people, all of these things affect the gray matter. And you want to make sure that you are using the things that help you to feel as good as you possibly can and not, like, not neglect them and not hope, not rely just on, on pharmaceuticals to improve your mood. I like how you brought up the gray matter. Can you just explain to the audience what gray matter is just in case they don't know? Okay, I'm sorry. Sorry for being um, unclear for anybody. Uh, gray matter is your brain. It's the, the brain cells. Um, and and it, your brain cells are all specialized. There's some that are controlling your motions. Uh, there are some that, that are taking in sensation and there are others that are regulating your moods. And your moods um, can be changed dramatically based on hormonal changes, based on changes in your gut bacteria, based on changes in how you're exercising. And so you wanna just be able to put that to work. What can people do to help treat an imbalanced thyroid and what role does iodine play in overall thyroid health? You know, probably 15 years ago, I would have said nothing. Um, the thyroid doesn't have too much to do with your, your diet. Um, we have learned so much in the past several years. And, 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 and one piece of this was, was pretty clear. Um, your thyroid gland is at the base of your neck. It's right there, it's tiny, it's not, you can barely feel it. Um, but it's got a huge job and it makes thyroid hormone, which goes through the bloodstream to the cells of your body and it gives them energy. If you don't have enough thyroid hormone, you've got no energy. You're gonna gain weight. Um, nothing seems to work right. Um, your skin won't look right, your hair won't, won't seem right, that, and that's hypothyroidism. Back in 1924, the Morton Salt Company started manufacturing iodized salt because you need iodine to make thyroid hormone. And the idea was if everybody uses salt, you get a little iodine that way. And I have to say it worked. Um, people really consuming iodized salt, you know, the one with the girl and the yeah. umbrella, the little blue canister. Um, that really knocked out iodine deficiency for much of the United States. Um, and, and that was a good thing, as long as you're not overdoing it with salt. Um, however, what then happened in more recent decades is people started using sea salt or Himalayan salt or kosher salt, which, which, which are not iodized unless it's specifically labeled that way, and most of them aren't. And so iodine levels for some people are a kind of uh, borderline. Now, if you go to Japan, you discover they don't care if you got the little blue canister or not, doesn't matter. They are having so much sea vegetables in their diet, which happen to be loaded with iodine. And, but if you grew up like I did in Fargo, you never heard of a sea vegetable. <laughs> so anyway, my, my, my tip is get to know sea vegetables. Let's say you're going to a sushi bar, don't have the fish sushi, but you have the cucumber roll and the nori that it's wrapped in is a great source of iodine as is the wakame in your miso soup and bring that into your routine. Iodized salt is okay, or if you want to, you can take iodine pills, about 150 micrograms a day is the amount, something like that. Uh, but that will give your thyroid the iodine it needs to, to do its job. Don't overdo it. You wanna be in, in balance. But then the other piece of this um, that we should also talk about is that foods completely independent of iodine can trigger thyroid problems too. And that's animal foods. Yes, um, yes. Because uh, we don't uh, like them. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. It's, it's true. Um, and, and here in the United States, this is, this is probably a bigger issue than the iodine issue. Worldwide, there are a lot of places that are low on iodine because of the, there's not iodine in the soil and they're not eating iodized salt. So that's a big problem outside the US. In the United States, the big issue is um, if you got low thyroid, it's called Hashimoto's thyroiditis. If you got high thyroid, that's called Graves' disease. In both cases, they happen to be autoimmune conditions, just what you were talking about earlier. What's that about? Well, the Adventist Health Study too came out with some just mind-blowing findings. They looked at a huge number of Seventh-day Adventists. And, and the reason they picked them is there's a lot of them and they are very health conscious, but although they're almost all non-smokers, almost all teetotalers, some are meat eaters, some are pescatarians, 
some are lacto-ovo, some are vegans, and you get this beautiful comparison. And what they found was amazing. They found that if you looked at uh, hypothyroidism, it was most common in the lacto-ovo vegetarians and least common in the vegans. Now, what's that about? So a lacto-ovo vegetarian is not eating meat. They're making up for it with Velveeta, you know, <laughs> um, eggs and dairy products. And they were at the highest, highest risk of hypothyroidism. What we believe is going on is that the dairy proteins are triggering an antibody reaction that's attacking the thyroid. Um, when it came to hyperthyroidism, too high thyroid, once again, the vegans did the best. They had the least problems with hyperthyroid. Yeah, I mean, it's just across the board. I mean, well, it makes sense. You're not, yeah. you are not ingesting animal antigens because if there is one thing that is clear with thyroid disease, in both hypo and hyperthyroidism, antibodies are attacking that thyroid. In hypothyroidism, they are turning it off. In hyperthyroidism, they are, they are shutting down the regulatory machinery so that you can't put the brakes on the thyroid anymore. You can't turn it off. Okay, so who did the worst? If it was hyperthyroidism, it was the omnivores. In this case, it was the meat products, the egg products, the dairy products, apparently all kind of conspiring together. Now, we need more research on this, uh, but a number of people have decided, I'm not gonna wait. Um, they've got hypothyroidism and they stop eating animal products. And in your body in balance, I gave a number of cases of people who have done this. And while I strongly encourage people to stick with their endocrinologist and follow their doctor's advice, you really ought to change your diet too and just see, because your endocrinologist can monitor you and can back you off on your synthroid doses or whatever as, as the diet takes effect. And so many people have discovered that they no longer need their medication, that that extra weight they couldn't lose, that sluggishness they thought was just there, these, all, these issues just sort of melt away. So um, if, if this is an issue for you, go out, get yours, see what happens. In your book, you mentioned what specific food should be consumed at the beginning portion of the day versus the end of the day. Can you help explain why heartier food should be eaten earlier for maximum health benefits? You know, this is a funny thing that we just keyed in on really by accident. Um, and and this, this is, I mean, there are many different parts of this, but one, one I'd like to focus on is, is the mood regulating chemical, mood regulating foods. Um, there are some people who get out of bed and they have a piece of bread, make some toast. Um, and it's, it's pretty starchy and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, but your body runs on the glucose that comes from starch, but later in the day, they don't feel so hot. Um, so what um, we have started to experiment with is we say, have some plant protein earlier in the day. So your grilled tempeh, um, a little bit of grilled tofu or something like that. Not a lot, just one slice or whatever. And then you discover that it has a tremendous mood stabilizing effect and what matters is having it early in the meal and early in the day. So you can have your toast, but have the high protein food first, plant protein. What is going on? What's going on is that the, the starchy foods will naturally trigger the brain to make more serotonin. Serotonin is involved in sleep and in mood regulation. And if your body is making it at night, when you wanna to go to sleep, that's great. But if it's 6.30 in the morning, that's not so hot. And you find yourself just not feeling so good. Um, plant protein blocks that from happening. So you have a little bit, like I say, tempeh, veggie bacon, whatever, or, or, or in, um, let's say I'm in the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. Um, what, what they're having is probably not veggie bacon, they're having black beans for breakfast. Almost all cultures have some kind of bean dish for breakfast. Uh, it might be, um, hummus in the Middle East, it might be black beans in Mexico, baked beans in London um, or in Sydney. Uh, but somehow in America, we kind of lost that tradition. And so we are having either toast or, or our protein comes from sausage or something that really does more harm and good. But, but anyway, give this a try. And you can also, women will also use this during that time of the month where they find I'm really moody right now. Give this a try. Uh, take some tempeh. If you, if you never had tempeh, give it a try. You get it, uh, cut it up into little squares, just dip it in a little soy sauce, throw it in your nonstick pan, cook it on both sides and keep it in the fridge. And you can zap it in the morning, heat it up. It's kind of a bacony, crispy flavor. And you can do the same with tofu if you want. Um, you will get addicted to it, but along the lines, it, you'll discover that your mood is just stabler for the rest of the day. 
Nice. I noticed that um, smoked paprika kind of gives it that that bacon flavor as well. So um, if somebody likes smoked paprika, smoked paprika, try it. You've never heard of this? I have heard, but I never tried it. How do you tell me how you do this? So yeah, just smoked paprika. So like, just like you said, you know, prepare whatever type of protein that you want, the tempeh or, or soy or tofu um, or even beans, and then yeah. dip it in some soy sauce or I'll use coconut aminos and then just smoke paprika. And it almost gives it like that bacon bit type of smell and taste. I love it. it now, forgive, forgive my ignorance on this. Is it a liquid or is it a powder? It's a powder. It's a powder. Yeah. In the spice, spice rack at the store? Yep. Johnny, you're teaching me something. I, as soon as we're done, I'm going to run up and buy some. Because you know, you know people, people are phobic of it. I have to I tell you, you know, people who people are afraid of tofu or tempeh until they've had them made the right way, and then they get totally addicted to it. But for some people, they 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 never they've never gone in that direction. So I have used um, ginger, nice. nutri ginger nutritional yeast, a little bit of soy sauce or Bragg's aminos mm -hmm. on these things. And, but I have not tried the smoked paprika. I'm excited for you. You have to let me know what you think of it. I will do so. What is citric acid and why is it dangerous to our health? Yeah, here we are kind of on the frontier of science. We were doing a study a number of years ago in women with migraines. Um, migraines are not just a stress headache. A migraine is a sledgehammer that is hitting you typically on one side of the head and it lasts not 45 minutes. It will last overnight to the next day. And what we were discovering is that um, many, many people, men and women, discover that their migraines are triggered by foods. And the classic ones were aged cheese and sausage and, and a glass of wine. But we also discovered that there were many other foods that were triggering, triggering it. Skim milk, organic skim milk was a big offender. Citric acid, which is, gives a little tangy, um, uh, flavor to some sodas, but it's used in lots of things. It's used sometimes in, in even in, in nutritional supplements that you'll buy. You'll see it in all kinds of foods. Um, turned out to be a trigger too for a number of people. And I, in this case, I, be, I believe that it probably is not the citric acid itself. It's probably the manufacturing process for it. It comes from a, a mushroom um, culture basically and bits of it seem to end up in the citric acid. And we, I'm guessing that that's the problem. But for my money, when I look at a label, if it's got citric acid in it, I don't get it for, for that very reason. Thank you for that. Um, because any little tips and tricks that we can get to continue, you know, even vegans that are on a whole food plant-based diet, any little things that we can keep learning to, to improve our health is so much appreciated. Well, um, thank you so much for your time today. And if anybody wants to check out Dr. Barnard's book, it's Your Body in Balance and it's all things hormone related. And um, it's also available on Audible, which is how I listen to it. I love listening and walking my dogs and stuff. So. Um, and is it your voice? Did, did you narrate it? I'm embarrassed to say I didn't. Okay. I, it, well, you're busy. You're very busy. <laughs> I, 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 would, I would have loved to, but it's somebody else. Thank you so much for tuning in. Love, Gianna. And Dr. Neil Barnard.